Thank you very much. It's my, my pleasure and my honor to be here. I think I know Danny less time than most of the speakers here, only in this century. Uh, but uh, we've had a, a very fruitful collaboration. What I thought I'd do is tell you a little bit about what I do and then show you how uh, we came together uh, to do research together. So the, this is a, a slide from uh, Salthouse, who's uh, sort of the dean of cognitive aging. And what he's tracking is three different cognitive abilities uh, over age. And you can see that, unfortunately, they decline with aging. Uh, not, not when you're older, but even from 20 to 30 and on. This, this line here is, is vocabulary, which is a, a capacity that's maintained. So we're very interested in cognitive aging, how it works, how to prevent it. What causes cognitive aging? We're really not sure. In this, in this I just graph a few things that change in the brain that we can measure with scanners. Uh, brain volume, just the size of the brain, the thickness of the cortex, uh, the white matter, white matter tract integrity, and white matter hyperintensities, which are these things that you can see with MRI, all of these get worse uh, with aging, and in some way they're correlated with cognitive change. Uh, so we think they probably have something to do with cognitive aging. Uh, the other thing is that um, with aging, the risk for Alzheimer's disease increases. These are the two known pathologies of Alzheimer's disease. These are plaques made of amyloid, tangles made of tau. Um, I'm interested in Alzheimer's disease, but the other important fact is that uh, even in uh, cognitively healthy people, studies have shown that come to autopsy, uh, completely cognitively healthy, about 30% have these plaques and tangles in their brain. So that it's influencing just n what, quote, normal cognitive aging as well. And today we can actually detect at least the plaques with a special kind of a PET scan. So all of these things probably influence cognitive aging. And these are probably the key uh, uh, um, uh, causes of Alzheimer's disease and dementia itself. So I've been very interested in trying to relate these kinds of measurable brain changes with their effect, with their clinical effect. And one thing that not just I, but many people have noticed is that there's not a one-to-one -one correlation between the amount of these pathologies, brain changes that we can see, and the clinical consequences of these pathologies. Uh, and so we've come up with this idea of reserve. The idea of reserve is that some people can cope with or compensate for these brain changes better than others. And to be straightforward with you, that's sort of been the uh, key thing that I've thought about for the last 15, 20 years. So anyway, what kind of, what is reserve? How does it work? Well, there's two kinds of mechanisms that, that people have talked about, brain reserve and cognitive reserve. The original idea of brain reserve was very simple, that perhaps some people have more neurons or synapses to lose. So as this pathology attacks the brain, they can do better because they have more left. Uh, over the years, we've learned a lot more, and, and we, we're learning that there's really anatomic changes in the brain on the basis of experience. So uh, people who exercise more or have more cognitive stimulation actually uh, grow more neurons in their dentate, in their uh, hippocampus, a very important area for memory. Uh, but uh, other things change too. Uh, I'm sure our Kramer will talk about it more. There's upregulation of chemicals that are responsible for synaptic plasticity. So the brain really does change. Uh, even more recently, we're beginning to understand that perhaps the, 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 the uh, activities that we engage in actually might influence the pathologies that I was outlining to you. They might help pr reduce brain volume, perhaps even help reduce Alzheimer's pathology. But I wasn't quite aware of that in, when we first started thinking about that. So what I was more concentrated on was, well, what do people do to cope with this pathology? And that comes to the idea of cognitive reserve, that the way that people um, think uh, uh, that might differ, and there might be differential resilience or plasticity of cognitive networks. That is, some people can cope better, either because they have more efficient ways of solving problems, more adaptive ways of solving problems, more resilient, or they could actually uh, compensate by using other areas of their brain. So the very first studies that I did that looked at that were in Alzheimer's disease. We were doing, we still do a very large study of the population around the Columbia University Medical Center. We're in the northern tip of Manhattan. And over the years, we followed thousands of randomly selected elders in that community. 
So I'll give you an idea of what we did. So the, uh, on top, is this is just a theoretical graph. You have this advancing Alzheimer's pathology. Uh, we know now that this pathology begins at least 15, 20 years before the onset of dementia, before the onset of Alzheimer's disease. And so the idea of cognitive reserve would be this. There are certain things that initiate this pathology. It advances over time. At some point, these clinical symptoms begin to appear very subtly. The person's diagnosed, and then the disease moves on. And the idea of reserve is very simple, that for some people, these clinical symptoms appear earlier, those with less reserve. For others, the symptoms appear later, those with more reserve. So in this study, we just followed people that were cognitively normal, elders, over time, and looked to see what happened. And what we found, uh, this is history already, is that the people with lower educational attainment, less than eight years, had twice the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease over four years. And the people with lower occupational attainment had twice the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So the idea was, we thought that must be something that comes from this educational exposure or this occupational exposure that gives these people the tools to cope with this brain change to cope with the pathology and allows them to put off the onset of the disease. I won't go into it a lot, but over the years, proxies for cognitive reserve, like IQ, education and literacy, occupational attainment, engager, engagement in leisure activities in late life, have in, been in many, many studies associated with this reduced risk of incident dementia, of developing a dementia also with a slower rate of cognitive decline in normal aging. So this is the type of epidemiologic evidence for reserve. The idea that somehow the exposures that we have through our life impart this reserve against uh, aging and against Alzheimer's disease. Here's a sort of a, a, a thought experiment on, on this axis here. This is in terms of dementia, cognitively normal. MCI is mild cognitive impairment. It's a term for people who have some problem but are not demented. Mild Alzheimer's, severe Alzheimer's. And over here is this Alzheimer's pathology going from mild to severe. So when the pathology is mild, Perhaps the people with low reserve already look demented. The people with high reserve don't. They can cope with it better. <laughs> Even when the pathology is more advanced, everybody already has Alzheimer's disease, but the people with higher reserve will have more mild impairment than the people with lower reserve. Again, because they can cope with this pathology better. You can make another prediction if you uh, think about it. If you take two people with the exact same amount, the exact same clinical severity, let's say mild Alzheimer's disease, think about this line, the people with lower reserve should have less Alzheimer's pathology than the people with higher reserve. They look the same clinically, but one group can handle more pathology than the other. So how to test that? Uh, the obvious thing is to do an autopsy study where you take two patients who come to autopsy, they look exactly the same clinically and measure plaques and tangles in their brain, but we couldn't do that back when I thought of the idea. So we use blood flow, uh, uh, and there's a specific type of blood flow change that occurs that's very much related to the Alzheimer's pathology, and the prediction was if you take two people who look clinically the same, or groups of people, who, and match them for clinical severity, those with higher reserve should have more pathology in their brain. And this is my favorite slide. I show it all of the time. So this is with Xenon. These are 60 Alzheimer's patients uh, above high school, high school graduates below high school, carefully matched for clinical severity. And you can see, especially in this temporal parietal area, as the disease gets more severe, there's less and less flow in this area as if these people have more and more pathology. So although they're clinically the same, these people are walking around with more pathology in their brains than these. And this has been subsequently, this was the first paper of its type, but subsequently people have done the autopsy studies and show that's exactly what's going on. Some people can cope with more pathology than others. So it's a good example of this cognitive reserve in action. Okay. Once I was convinced that there was such a thing as reserve from the epidemiology and studies such as those that I just showed you, the question was, how, how does it work? And I guess I could have gone two ways. If, I think if I had known Danny then, I would have taken a different path and a more cognitive experimental path, testing how it works, what it does. Uh, I have an idea of what it does. Can I test it experimentally? But I, I was seduced into imaging. At that time, uh, neuroimaging was getting very hot. 
and I had a very simple idea. Let's take people with different amounts of purported reserve and see what they do differently as they do tasks. Uh, and, and that's been a long adventure. I'm not going to get into it in detail. But one study that we did was specifically to see if we could find the generic imaging pattern associated with reserve. And we did something pretty simple. We gave people two different tasks. I'm sorry you can't see this too well. This is a memory task where they see one, two, or three shapes. And then at the end, a shape pops up and they just say yes or no. That's the shape I just saw. It's a shape Sternberg task. It's based on the tasks by Sternberg. We did another one with letters. And the idea was, can we find a pattern in the brain that's activated in increasing increases in activation as we make the task harder and harder. And it's the same pattern in both of these tasks, the shape and the letter task, and the people with higher cognitive reserve use it the most. In other words, can we find a cognitive reserve network? So in young people, at least, we did. We found a brain network of where in two different tasks, the load-related increase in expression, that is the increase in expression of this network as the task got harder and harder, correlated with their IQ. And we felt that this was sort of a very early um, proof that you could find something like a cognitive reserve network. Now, why am I showing this particular study? Because if you look at the areas of the brain where that increased in expression, those are the green areas. These are these prefrontal areas that are associated with uh, executive function. The frontal lobe is associated with executive ability. Executive ability is a, uh, a tough thing to define. It has to do with coordinating tasks, switching between tasks, attentional control, uh, task set. So you can see where I'm heading with this. Another, another thing that we did was a, 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 a more of a, a mathematical uh, analysis of data that we had. I had a graduate student, a postdoc, Karen Selesky, who did something called structural equation modeling, and she wanted to see if cognitive reserve was a separate construct, separate from memory or speed or executive function. So here she has a lot of measures of cognitive reserve uh, that we've used, uh, uh, vocabulary, occupational attainment, reading, education. And here we had measures of memory, speed, and executive function. And she did show that they really are separate, statistically, separate latent constructs. But one thing that she also showed is that if you look at how these different latent constructs talk to each other, executive ability and cognitive reserve really were very strongly related. Again, hinting that this executive function might really play a role. Now, if you try to think of what is it that can uh, go across many, many tasks, day-to-day -day life, and help people perform better, some generic thing. Better memory is just associated with very specific tasks. But this executive control could be something, attentional allocation, all of those things could really show its head in many, many tasks and really be very beneficial for people. So th it's about that point uh, that, that uh, I met Danny. Uh, uh, actually, I was, I was coming here to visit my daughter. She was in uh, school here for a year. And I, I, I sought out Danny because I knew that he did a lot of work in things that I was interested in, uh, a, a executive ability, but also workload, uh, things that I thought would be very interesting. And we sat and talked and had a nice schmooze. And then um, he came to visit in uh, New York uh, a month or two, maybe a couple months later. And he said, you know, while I'm here, I want to give two talks. Uh, I said, you know, usually we have a guest that give one. He said, no, I, wa I want to give two, because there's two very different things that I, I want to talk about. And so the two studies that I'll show you really are direct outcomes of these two talks that Danny gave. Um, so this age-related age performance deficits really can be attributed to reduced executive capacities. In aging, that's one of the most common and earliest changes that occur in normal aging. And I, I think I've described most of these points. Let me just review coordination of more than one task at a time, maintenance of goal-relevant information, manipulation of stored uh, information and working memory, switching between tasks. So Danny came and he presented a task that tested a lot of these things in one task. And I, I have to say right now, I'm going to show you the task, but I'm going to leave out half of it just for simplicity uh, because there, there's just so much going on. Uh, it, it, it's a straightforward task built on uh, this concept of set switching. In set switching, usually what you do is you have people perform two different tasks. Here, one task is letter classification. They just see letters and say if they're vowels or consonants. 
And in another task, they see numbers, and they just decide if they're odd or even. And the main thing about set switching is that they first do one task, and then they switch to another, back to the first, back to the second. And what happens if you uh, do a task repeatedly, you can do it much more quickly. When there's a switch from one task to another, your reaction time is increased. It's called a switch cost. You're, you're, you're having to shift your abilities, your, your, your programs, and, 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 and pulling up a different way of doing the task. And part of what Danny really built into this task was uh, a manipulation that I won't talk about, to talk about, well, how much of it is bringing on the new programs and getting rid of the old. I won't even get into that. So we have this set switching task. And what we do is we'll have blocks where people just do the same task over and over again, letter tasks or digit tasks. And then we'll have blocks where people switch back and forth. And one of the manipulations built in was how often do you switch between tasks? You can switch 50% of the time or only 10% of the time. So this was one manipulation that was built into the task. The thought is that if you're switching back and forth constantly, it might be a little easier because you're sort of prepared to switch, but it might have other implications. If you have switch less frequently, only 10% of the time, that switch might have more cost. <laughs> Another manipulation was this response mapping. There's two ways that you can set this up. You can either have people use two fingers that give the answer both for the letters and for the numbers. Or you could use four fingers and have one hand dedicated to the letters and one hand dedicated to the numbers. So in this task, we have all these different things built in. Set switching, the, um, the frequency of the set switching, and the type of um, response, which I have to say that using the, the output is something that a, a, a lot of neuropsychologists don't think about. We think of the task, we don't worry about the output. Clearly, in, in human factors research, the output is the key thing. So it becomes very important. And just to give you an idea of what we found, sorry this is blocked. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated graph, but I'll show you. Here's young people, this side, old people responding with two fingers, four fingers, two fingers, four fingers, and this is 10% blocks and 50% blocks, when the set switching is only 10% of the time or 50. So the first thing you can see just looking at this graph is that old people are slower. Even these, these black bars are the repeat blocks, all people are slower. Another thing that you can see is that when you um, make a switch to in the 50% condition, that's these open bars, even in the young people, you can do it faster than in the 10% condition. When the switch is infrequent, you can respond more, fat, more quickly than when the, more slowly, it, it, you respond more slowly than when the uh, switch is very frequent. As if you're, you sort of get into this rhythm of responding and then you have to switch. And that, that switch cost is really magnified in the old people. And finally, this, this thing sticking out over here has to do with uh, the um, four, letter, four fingers versus two fingers in this four finger response condition, the old people really have a tremendous amount of trouble and it's really magnified in this 10% switch block. So as we make the task more and more complicated, build up only 10% uh, of the time switching, uh, put a more demanding response output to it, we're really uh, bringing out uh, these deficits that these older people have. Uh, and I, 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 I'm simplifying a lot of it, but it's, it's a very nice task for really extracting a lot of information about this executive deficit in aging. And so that was one, one project. Danny came showing us this project. He, uh, he had been doing it in young people, so our, our contribution was to work and, and, and work on it with older people as well. Now, I've been talking about cognitive reserve and, and, and I, I think you know that the zeitgeist now is, can we do something that people have age-related pathology, and, and let's not even call it clinical disease, just normal aging, can we do something to impart reserve? Give people an experience that will let them cope with aging better. And that's something that we had been thinking about quite a bit. And that brings us to the Space Fortress. 
so until, until Danny came to visit, I, I have to admit I hadn't heard a, about the Space Fortress. I think Art had heard of it already, uh, Art Kramer, because uh, he was involved in, in, in helping to build it. So Danny came and he gave a talk uh, about the Space Fortress and intervention. For those of you not familiar with this, it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a game that was custom built for uh, research. It was developed by psychologists, so every pet issue that any psychologist had in developing is built in. Uh, I, I don't have a movie of it, but this is this fortress. It's exactly what it looks like on the screen. Uh, very primitive. That's the ship. The fortress shoots at the ship. The ship shoot, tries to shoot at the fortress. If it hits it 10 times, then a double shot, it could destroy the fortress. Meanwhile, these mines show up. If they show up, they could be friend or foe, and you have to deal with the mines. Every once in a while, these bonus points come up, and if you um, uh, uh, press appropriately when the when this uh, signal comes up, you can get bonus points. It's a complex video game uh, that's designed to really uh, get at a lot of functions: attentional allocation, uh, straightforward attention. Uh, uh, it, it's a very nice research tool. I think my next slide has it. Yeah, and what Danny showed is, I'm sure many of you know, there was this big competition across, uh, sponsored by DARPA across many centers. And what Danny showed is that using emphasis change training really provided the best training for this. So everybody in these different places did 10 sessions of this, 10 one-hour sessions. And uh, using emphasis change training, uh, it produced the best results in training. What goes on in emphasis change? The subjects always perform the whole task. They're not directed to one part of it only. They're doing the whole task but they get a little prompt before each game, this time focus on ship handling, a little bit. Play the whole game, but focus on ship handling. Other time they play the game, focus on uh, handling those mines. And by giving people that kind of emphasis, it, ex it encourages subjects to not fall into a good enough strategy, but to explore all of the response space, to perform the task from different perspectives, adopt different management strategies, Danny said it, 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 it increased the task shell, which is the whole structure that engages the task. To my mind, it increased executive capacity as a, as a neuropsychologist. And the most interesting thing about it to me is that in Air Force pilots, playing the game this way was associated with better performance in the simulator and better performance in learning how to fly a jet. And in a follow-up study, in just cognitively normal people, uh, uh, young people, it was associated with uh, the ability to absorb new demand. So people could play the space fortress, and if they were cha trained with this emphasis change condition, they could take new demands. Let's say that now uh, a light came up and they had to press a pedal. They could absorb that into uh, their performance much better than if they were trained any other way. So I was very excited by this, and I said to Danny, you know, it would be really cool to do this with old people. He said, you know, Yaakov, this is way too hard. We did this at the, tech this was pre-video games when it was done at the Technion, and even the Technion students hated it. It was way too hard for them. I think today, for people who are raised with video games, it's, it's, it's still a very challenging game, but it's different. There's no way that you can have old people do this. I'll tell you the truth, you can use the exact same principles, but with a simpler task. I said, well, I, 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 I'm sure we could do that, but I think it's, it, it would be more sexy to use this video game. And what Danny said to me is, you know, which I remember very well, he said, Yaakov, I never get between a man and his sex. <laughs> so, so we decided to do it. Uh, and what, what we did is in, 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 with the students and the Air Force candidates, 10 one-hour sessions, we decided we'll do 36 sessions, three times a week over 12 weeks, to give people time to, to learn the task. And we had to adapt the training uh, to older people, but in the end it was the exact same game that they were playing. So 60 cognitively healthy uh, uh, elders and three conditions. So some were tested with neuropsych testing, no gameplay, they were just tested again 12 weeks later. Some played the game, but they didn't get this emphasis change training. They just played it the best that they could, and some played with the emphasis change training. I think it's a very brave control condition because it really tests directly what emphasis change training does over just playing the game. Three months of gameplay, 36 one-hour sessions, and then we tested them with neuropsych testing. So the first thing was, could we get these older people to play this game? 
And it's very interesting. I'll, I'll show you older people can play, but their scores start where uh, uh, an Air Force candidate might start at minus 500 or 1,000. The old people start at minus 2,000 or minus 3,000. But over time, with uh, very uh, patient coaching, they really do get better at the game. And I remember Danny came to visit. Uh, we had just started this study uh, at a subsequent visit. And I said, you want to go down and see some older people playing the fortress? The first one we walked in, it was this woman who was just starting all over the place. Her, her ship was wrapping off the screen. She just had no control at all. And I got a very knowing look. Like, <laughs> I told you, the old people can't do this. We went back in the afternoon. Someone who'd been playing the game for a month or so, she wasn't uh, an Air Force candidate, but she was controlling the ship. She was handling the mines. I, I thought Danny was going to kiss this woman. Uh, it was, he was just very excited by it. And, and so the, the first thing is that they liked to play. They didn't care that they were bad at it. They got better over time. Uh, everyone was very sad when their 36 sessions were up. <laughs> uh, really, they said, I, I have to stop. And now we're working on a, a web-based version of it just for that reason. What about the data? So I'll tell you quickly, how, how am I doing with time? Oh, good. I have plenty of time. So first, so here's uh, just total score on this uh, over the 12-week period. And something very interesting, obviously, let's look first. They start at minus 3,500, and they max out at about minus 1,000. That's not what young people do. Young people start up over here, and they're into, my son came in to play the game. The very first time he played, he was a very, he's a good game player. He was at about uh, 1,000. He said it's very hard to play it very well, but he would, got better very quickly. But the point is that it's scalable. Even though it's harder for these people, they can play it, and they could get better over time, which is very nice. And, uh, and this was Danny's point. It's nice that it's the exact same task that you can give to old people and young people. The thing that happened, which we didn't anticipate, is that the pure gameplay people, the people who just said, you know, play the game, do the best you can, actually by the end ended up with a higher average performance than the people in the emphasis change condition. This is opposite of the studies in young people. Uh, in young people, you always see that this condition, the emphasis change condition, produces better performance. What, what was going on? Why is that? Well, one thing that we didn't anticipate, at least I didn't, but when I look back at the early papers, it was there even in young people, is that there's a specific strategy that you can take if this game is too hard for you. So remember what you're doing. You've got this joystick. You're trying to control this, um, this uh, plane a uh, spaceship, whatever you want to call it, that's Im almost impossible to control. It either, uh, all you can do is uh, accelerate or turn right and left. So if you don't have good control, it just shoots off the screen, wraps up on the back, and then you've got to learn to attack the space fortress. At the same time, remember, I told you there's a symbol that comes up every once in a while, and if you do something when the symbol comes up, you get points. So one strategy is just to go for those bonus points and not pay so much attention to the to, the, um, to, to flying the ship. And, and the people who were not in the emphasis change condition were much more likely to take these bonus points. They developed a, a very reasonable strategy. You know, we didn't think about it. We should have said to them, look, you've got to play the game. But, but there's something about just telling them before the, each game is, a, is about three minutes. So something just about telling them before each game, focus on handling the ship, focus on dealing with the mines drove these people to uh, worry less about the bonus points than the people in the pure gameplay condition. Now, when you get to space fortress destruction, the people in the um, uh, emphasis change condition were much more likely to become successful at that. So just those simple instructions somehow created a, a qualitatively different experience for these two groups. The other thing I don't have a slide for, um, but I could tell you is the other big issue is that this task really requires very good motor control. And uh, before you do, before people usually are trained on this task, they take this little aiming task where they just have to rotate a, uh, a, a, a cannon and shoot at things. And in the young students, 
they didn't let people play unless they got a specific score because they figured we can't train these people unless they are pretty good at this motor control. For the older people, we did not do that. We, let, we took in all comers. But it turns out that people who are better at that aiming task really are much more successful at learning this game. So this game really has some very strong motor demands uh, that I think would have to be attenuated a little bit in order to make this a, a game for, for all elders. Okay. So, and what about pre-post cognitive testing? So we gave uh, about five different, quote, executive measures. Uh, and on one of the tests, we really did find the uh, effect that we were looking for. Uh, this is a, a working memory task called letter number sequencing. And you can see in this one task in the ex executive, uh, in the um, emphasis change condition, those people improved while the people in the other two conditions did not. But I have to admit that in four other tasks, we saw no difference across the groups. And this led to a whole other discussion about, well, what, what is the real appropriate outcome measure for this kind of intensive training? Uh, and, and, and probably a, a neuropsychological test is not the best answer. The best answer is a, a tasks or conditions that really monitor behavior in detail uh, in real life. And that's something that's really plaguing all of these um, studies of intervention and aging, because that's really what we want to see. Do they pay their bills a little faster? Do they drive better? Uh, you know, do they manage their, their life more efficiently? That's very hard to capture. Uh, even driving, which is a very demanding thing. In New York City, a lot of people don't drive, so we can't, we can't even use that. But, but I'm convinced, and, and I think Danny more so, that, that this experience over these 36 sessions really did impart something that is making a difference. So what's going on now? Um, there's two ongoing intervention trials that we're doing. One of them, I think, is most of interest is now, uh, given this feasibility data, we got a grant from the National Institute on Aging to, uh, to do a little more complex study with normal, healthy elders. The key condition is space fortress plus aerobic exercise. You'll hear more about this later. Aerobic exercise, in the next talk, I, I would guess, at least a little bit, uh, aerobic exercise really is very beneficial for cognition in normal aging. So the idea I is that maybe this combination of the space fortress and aerobic exercise would truly be synergistic. Uh, another condition is space fortress with stretching and toning. That's a, a, a placebo condition for the aerobic exercise. And the third is placebo games and stretching and toning, a placebo condition. So we're in the middle of that study right now. What this study entails is people coming to the cognitive lab three times a week and going to the gym four times a week. So as you can imagine, it's only a very special kind of person that really wants to devote the time to that. So we're slowly accruing our, 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 our subjects. And the other study that we're doing is uh, long-term just aerobic exercise, not, not with any kind of cognitive intervention, uh, but there um, we are using people uh, that are much younger than are typically in these exercise studies, 30 to 45 and 50 to 65. And what we're doing there is the outcome measures that we're using are very akin to these kinds of performance tasks like the Space Fortress. So that's built in there as well. So that's, that's basically my story. So wh what I tried to tell you is a little bit about cognitive reserve. The epidemiologic evidence supports it. I showed you a little bit of imaging evidence with resting flow that supports it. One thing to uh, stress is that this reserve really is not something you're born with. It's really malleable. And that gives us this idea that even in later age, you can impart reserve. Uh, when I published the first, uh, that first study of uh, incident Alzheimer's disease in the North Manhattan community, though, I got a lot of press. It was in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association. They like to get a lot of press on their papers. And the most interesting interview I had was with Seventeen Magazine. I'm sure you probably have a magazine like that in Israel. Seventeen Magazine is a magazine for about 13-year-old girls and it's, you know, how to dress, you know, for the prom and how to, uh, you know, advice about makeup. And I said to the, um, the reporter, why is your readership, why are your readers interested in this study about Alzheimer's disease? And she was very smart. She said, well, stay in school. <laughs> she, uh, so she really caught it. So, it, you know, when you want to intervene late, it's one thing. But if you give people better experiences throughout their life course, uh, that would probably be a better way. 
Influencing cognitive reserve may delay or reverse the effects of brain uh, aging or brain pathology. And ex executive control may be an important component underlying reserve. And I think the key point uh, 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 is that I think that these engaging complex tasks performed over time may have potential to give people a generic boost, not just a, a little bit better in memory or not just a little bit better in language function, but a generic boost that generalizes across multiple activities. And of course, uh, the reason I'm here is to thank Danny for his guidance uh, and collaboration in helping me move these studies forward. So again, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you.